Hello, I'm Brett Moss, and you're watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. Our guest today is Dr. Antonio Betancourt. Dr. Betancourt is the director of the Office of Government Relations for the Universal Peace Federation in Washington, D.C. He's also the executive director of both the Summit Council for World Peace and Association for the Unity of Latin America. Dr. Betancourt is president of the World Institute for Development and Peace, which is dedicated to the advancement of economic justice and democratization. Dr. Betancourt has been married for nearly 25 years. He and his wife, Kyoko, have four children together. Dr. Antonio Betancourt, welcome to The Defining Moment. It's my honor to welcome you back to our show and for another installment on in our series of addressing serious global issues. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Greetings from the East Coast again. It's so wonderful to be back in your show. I'm happy to be here. It's great having you. Our topic today is moral relativism and the perversion of American values. Dr. Betancourt, was there a defining moment when you realized that traditional American values were being threatened by the popular culture? Well, you know, Brett, I came to this country in 1967. And from the moment I came, I was so attracted to the American values, so different from the values in Colombia. One of the things that, uh, that I, I was very attractive to me was the values of honesty, uh, the values of fidelity, uh, the values of generosity, the values of rectitude, moral rectitude, dependability. I mean, there's just so many values that are, has been part of my everyday experience in America. When the late uh, Mother Teresa was alive and she came to America, um, she was interviewed on television on some particular subject. And they were kind of running a poll on this particular subject with different people, including celebrities. And they interviewed Madonna, the singer. And for me to find uh, that the networks will dare to put on the same level of interviewing a person that is considered globally, not just by Christians, but many people of different persuasions, a saint, to be interviewed uh, with the same, for the same subject with, with a singer like Madonna, it revealed to me something very crazy very uh, strange about America. And at that moment, I realized I have to understand more about uh, popular culture. What makes popular culture uh, so appealing to the masses and from America to the world? And why is popular culture dangerous? And I found that within the so-called popular culture, at the core, is a new concept of morality, we may say, which we call moral relativism. I began to study moral relativism, or what it does to the individual, to the family, to the community, to the nation, and eventually to the world. And uh, I decided to study it and make people aware of it so they can understand the consequences of moral relativism to the culture of the nation, the culture of America. Okay, thank you very much. Can you explain what is meant by the term moral relativism in everyday language? Since ancient times, uh, societies had had a frame of morals by which they arrange societies. Their, their, their relations among themselves, the relations between communities, families and communities, and the relation between the states and so forth. And those arrangements has been, ma has been uh, made from the values that come from the ancient text, the ancient uh, writings of the prophets or saints or the values or religions. Moral relativism involves an understanding that there is no absolutes, there are no moral absolutes. So when you exercise a judgment, whether it be ethical or moral, you cannot come from a moral absolute 
or a, an absolute standard, that everything goes, that the individual decide according to the time, according to the location, according to the situation, what kind of morality should you em employ. That is moral relativism. There is no absolute, anything goes. Okay, thank you very much. Why should we be concerned that moral relativism is spreading like a virus throughout America? What, is, what do you see as being at stake? Well, what is at stake is the base of American thought. In the name of modern thought, the ancient understandings of how society should be organized, the concepts of right and wrong, the concepts of, of good and evil, the, con the concepts of, of vice versus virtue are blurred. When in the name of, of being modern, in the name of being ahead, being progressive, uh, you begin to give up your moral stand. You begin to consider uh, the uh, unnecessary of moral, uh, morals and, and, and uh, traditional uh, values. Uh, you have a problem. Why? Because instead of moving forward, you create the conditions for chaos. That's my, my view. Okay, and with those conditions of chaos, you know, what, what stands to be lost? What stands to be lost is what has been considered since time immemorial worth saving, worth preserving, sacred, uh, things that you don't mess up with. I said, for example, that when I came to America, I admire the seriousness in which young people consider fidelity, concept of fidelity. Not only myself, but a lot of people believe that if you're not able to be faithful to your wife, you cannot be faithful to the contracts that you acquire in the marketplace. It just don't, don't work. So if those concepts of fidelity, the concepts of honesty, the concepts of, of sacrifice, and uh, the concepts of selflessness, all of that is compromised because it's considered obsolete. Old fashioned. Old fashioned. Uh, then, then you have a problem because things begin to fall apart. Disintegrate. The relationships between parents and children, the, the relationship between siblings, the relationship between husband and wife, the relationships within the family, and therefore within communities begin to disintegrate because there is no fabric to hold them together, which is those values that come, whether it be from Judaism, from the Torah, or from Christianity, the Gospel, or from uh, uh, Islam, the Holy Quran, uh, Confucianism, Hinduism, and so forth and so forth. Here in America, we've already seen a great amount of disintegration within the family unit take place since the 1950s. You know, divorce has been rampant, and now there are new definitions of families in America. Some people feel that's a form of progress. Uh, how do you view that? Well, the problem is that the intellectual intelligentsia of America, the, those who write books of consequence, those who uh, command at the, Washington, uh, at the Washington Post, the New York Times, New York Times Book Review, you know, those who write in journals that are uh, intellectually appealing, they're mostly, at best they're agnostics, at worst they are militant atheists. There is no religious people in America 
that are part of the mainstream of culture, that are making a dent in fashion, in, in, in popular culture. They've been sidelined. They've been sidelined. And to be cool, to be in, to be included, you have to be part of this moral relativism which calls for the glorification of ugliness, disorder, disobedience, rebelliousness, the Degra dark side. Degradation. Degradation, the glorification of the dark side of us. Each person has the upper and the lower. Traditionally, the lower has been suppressed and belongs to, we may say, to the sewer. <laughs> so now the sewer has been, become glorified. Culture of sewer. Uh -huh. In everything that is ugly, everything that has been with us since time immemorial, yes. that belongs to the the, the senses, to be, to belongs to the animal nature that we seek to suppress or we seek to, to transform into a greater, into a higher nature uh, by enhancing our spiritual part. Our innocence, our, our purity, our goodness. Yes, uh, the saints of, of greatness was separate us from the animal kingdom, from the instinct. Now the instinct is glorified or equalized to a spiritual. That is part of the moral relativism. If it and, feels, and a if kind it of feels good, uh -huh. you do it. In other words, the, the, the um, belief that discipline is not necessary, that to discipline your body, the appetites of your body, that no matter what, you cannot control the appetites of your body. This kind of belief is, is, is rampant in education, for example, in America. Why do they give condoms? Why they don't believe in, uh, they don't believe in, in abstinence? Because they believe that, that humans are unable to control their appetites. The, the, the narrative since ancient times has been that humans are higher than animals and therefore we are not to be ruled by our instincts but that we have to rule our instincts by higher callings, by higher commitments, by higher values, by mm -hmm. higher things. But today those higher, nothing is higher. Everything is level up, equal. So we are basically at the mercy of our physical senses. So music, drama, um, fiction, uh, movies, uh, song, everything is geared towards the enhancing of this physical... Lower nature. The lower nature, the dark nature, the dark side, the alley. You know, in fashion, they glorify the alley. What's going on in the alley? You know, the, the, the shooting of drugs in the alley. The, uh, the, expose, the exposing part of the body you know, Sex as, a, as, a natural, sexuality. as a natural thing. Uh -huh. The sexualization of children. Yes. The uh, situation, uh, ethics in which, in which a child is sexualized already by seven, uh, eight years old, he is already looked as a sexual object. And parents and grandparents are taught that it's natural for the children to be sexualized at that age. They rob the children of the natural innocence and the ability for them to learn, to understand the, their instincts as they grow older, as they grow into their 18s and 20s, in which they are more capable to controlling, to discipline the lower parts. So since they are sexualized at the age of seven, eight, and nine, mm -hmm. by the time they begin to, the girls begin to ovulate and the boys begin to, to, sperm, uh, to create a sperm, you have pregnancies because the children are, are denied the ability, the, uh, the right to be a child, the right the, the, to engage in children's plays without adult situations, without eroticizing their relationships. Okay. Very clear. That is all the result of moral relativism. Okay, thank you very much. Why has America, which is a 
traditionally Judeo-Christian nation, the very strong tradition, why has it failed to stop moral relativism? It failed to stop uh, because America somehow became the mecca of the modern world. And for the last 46 years, since 1960, America has gone to a transformation of, of uh, popular culture has been impregnated with, with uh, uh, deconstruction, which is part of the moral relativis re relativism uh, implications in, in, in the popular culture. Uh, the process of deconstruction uh, basically is to deconstruct all the, the values that we inherit. Instead of uh, absolute moral values, they bring situational values, uh, values that can change according to the time and, and so forth. Uh, the, the sexual revolution began in the 1960s uh, created a major challenge to the values that people have, to the scruples, uh, to the to the uh, the barriers that people had from promis to promiscuity, to allow allow the monster within within to be free reign to have free reign, uh, all of that has been changed in the last forty six years. Okay, very clear. Thank you. One of the strengths of America is the value of freedom, which you're kind of just describing, and the pursuit of happiness. What is the relationship between these values and moral relativism? Well, the beauty of America is the, the self-evident truth that, that every man is created equal and is endowed by the Creator, not by the state, endowed by the Creator with the rights of freedom, uh, liberty, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But you have to understand that these understandings, these uh, values, come from the founding fathers who came, they came to that understanding from a deep understanding of the Bible, of the book, of the holy book, from different de days, you know, they, they did not belong to one single religion. Right. One, some, mm -hmm. some were, were uh, Christians and some were Jewish, but they came to understand freedom, the pursuit of happiness, liberty, um, life from those, those values. As universal values. As universal, universal values. However, what moral relativism has done is to, is to, is to deny that, deny the base, and force people in the name of the modern, modern world, in, in the name of modernity, in the name of being cool and being, and being ahead, being progressive, to deconstruct all those, all those values. To, to, in a sense, cut, cut the relationship to the roots, to of, the roots of our very culture. And then leave people with these other understandings which basically uh, cr creates the conditions for people not be able to discipline themselves, not to tame the monster within who is selfish, greedy, the potential to lie and cheat. So what, what motivates people to advance the cause of moral relativism? It's much easier to be evil, <laughs> to be lazy. It's much, easy, it's, it's much easier to be lustful and allow loss to prevail than to refrain it. It's much easier to cheat and lie than to be, uh, than to be uh, 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 morally right and honest and to be disciplined and to, and to meet your commitments. It's much easier not to do those things. It's much to, easier to, not to relax. not have to listen to your conscience, for example. Exactly. It's much easier not to listen to your conscience, to, to convince yourself that all of that is hogwash in order to be free for freedom's sake. Freedom without responsibility. Licentiousness, in a sense. Exactly. Freedom comes with responsibility because the question is freedom for what? I, I want freedom for what? In the ancient understandings from the Greeks 
and the Romans and from the Christian gospel and from the holy text of all religions, freedom was to create. I need to be free in order to create. It's not to be free in order to destroy myself and everything around me in the name of a very uh, strange concept of individualism. The individual is supreme in this new concept of moral relativism. The individual is supreme above the purpose of the whole, above the purpose of the family, the wife, the community, the, everything. At, I am at, the supreme. At odds with those things you're saying. Exactly. Mm -hmm. e exactly. So, so it does not build. It deconstruct and destroy. Okay. Thank you. Another strength of America is the free market. We put a high value on free market economy, for example. Does moral relativism affect the free market? And if so, how? And what about vice versa? Does the free market affect moral relativism? That's a very interesting question. Because now we enter into the, uh, the external part, you know, the market, the market forces. When you erode the base in which you stand with moral rectitude, what gives you the ability to be honest, the ability to withstand the winds of fortune with moral fortitude. When you give up all those values, the, the market that has its own dynamics, who deals with a different kind of value, which is the value of material, money, then what happens is that the lower part of human nature, the dark side of human nature, plus the market, rules, profit, what sells. So vice is sold at a high price because it's much easier to be, to, to, to be vicious, to, to, I mean, to, to be of, of a vice. To be Sin in, sinful, to, to be sinful, to be immoral. Uh -huh. It's much easier to to be addicted to sex, to drugs, to alcohol, to tobacco, to all kinds of things. It's much e much easier to be like that, especially if the market forces are mobilized to sell that. When I said, for example, when you see the way advertisement sells. Uh, uh, um, the dark side, uh, in underwear, for example, uh, the sexualization of, 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 of advertisement, the alley, you know, you no longer fear the alley, you know, the dark alley with all the things that are going on in the alley. It becomes another option. It's just as exactly. valid as any other option. And, and the market has an incredible ability to seduce, to tell you what you need to tell you what will give you happiness, fulfillment, pleasure. It's all, it's all mirages. It's all artificial. It's all material. It becomes, it becomes the status quo, in a sense. Exactly. So, moral relativism, close the market, is, is dangerous because you have vulnerable people. Hanging in the balance. Exactly. Who, are, who become convinced you know, that it's only the material that will give them the happiness. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this material is connected with the senses, with the dark side. So this is a, a formula for disaster for people, especially for people who are weak, people who have weakness. Okay. Now, you talked about this dark side. Do you think that we're created with this kind of innate contradiction within ourselves between good and evil and a propensity for vice and a predis predisposition to give in to evil? I personally don't believe so. And if you ask most religious people, most people, regardless of what religion they belong to, they will tell you that no, that man was not meant to be like that, that that is the result of a separation from the Creator, from the values that the, the, the Creator had for, 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 for humans in the beginning, uh, what we call the fall, the fall of man. The fall of man separated man from, not only from God, from, from the ideal. So 
man in, his, in, in a fallen state is weak and has the propensity for vice. And uh, people have profited from vice and weakness throughout history. And today they have perfected the art of profit from vice and, and human weakness. And moral relativism is the philosophy behind, you know, to justify evil intellectually, politically, uh, spiritually, psychologically, etc., etc. Okay, very clear. Thank you. What kind of culture can we imagine for America and the world in the future when an entire generation which has been seduced by moral relativism comes of age? It's a very frightening, it's a very frightened picture. Imagine in the purely external world, if people begin to give up on the decimal system, on the standards that are used to, for measurements, you know, mm -hmm. whether it is for building uh, physical structures or social structures. Imagine... If we just pulled mathematics out of, out of, out of our life. <laughs> not maths, uh -huh. but you begin to compromise with the maths. Okay. If you begin to compromise with the, with the measurement system, and instead of taking an absolute standard, you begin to compromise here and there, everything begins to collapse. You cannot trust the system anymore. You cannot trust the building. You cannot trust... The, the electronics. The tr mode of transportation. You cannot trust anything yeah. because it can collapse, it can kill you, it can destroy you any minute. Yeah, very, very interesting. The, the same thing happens with the standards of how society arranges themselves. We don't have the, the best, we don't have the perfect, perfect moral standards. We don't have them yet. But the wise men of the past, Plato, Aristotle, um, Jesus, you know, whether you call him the son of God or a prophet, uh, the, the prophet Muhammad, uh, Buddha, Confucius, uh, Zoroaster, uh, all those great masters of the past and those who follow them were able to give us an approximation to perfect measurements in how society should arrange are arranged themselves, what is called, what Rousseau called the social contract. It was out of, 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 of the masters that they came to these approximations. It's, they're not perfect, but these are the measurements through which society arranged itself. And you build, you build a family, you build a community, you build a nation. They're not perfect, but is the best we have. If you give it up and you replace them with man-made values, some person, quote-unquote, enlightened from Harvard or from Princeton or from Louvain or from wherever, or from wherever, and we replace these timeless values for man-made ones, you got a big problem. Yeah, because you cannot trust that society. That society will crash as the building will collapse. Yeah. That bridge will collapse as well as those families will not withstand. And those communities will not stand. And those nations will not stand. Well, many people like in America, you know, to Rome, ancient Rome. And obviously Rome collapsed under a similar type of situation. So yeah, the, the, because the moral they, values. They, they, they began to adopt... Uh, this moral relativism, moral relativism is not new. It's mm -hmm. been with us since time immemorial. And when they, whenever they adopt that kind of view of themselves, of the invisible world, God, the myths that sustain them, the eternal, eternal life, the spiritual world, whenever they adopted this kind of views and, uh, and, and incorporated in their daily lives, in their behavior, those societies collapse. Yes. It's a fact that you can study in how the ancient world, uh, the, the ancient civilizations collapse. Very clear. Thank you very much. Do you feel that religions have any power to reverse this process? And if so, how? 
At this moment, religious don't have the power because they do not have the power individually. What you need to convene is the collective power of religion because religion has been the recipients of a language, a lexicon, a language of the heart, a language that is not science, it's not scientific, it's not military, it's not political. It's the language of the heart, it's the language of the immanent, of the invisible. But it's the most consequential for the visible corporeal world. Only through religion you can define fidelity. And there is not two or three understandings, there is one. Whether, whether you ask the Hindu or the Jew or the Christian, there is only one understanding. What is fidelity? What is filial piety? What is honesty? What is selflessness? And, and the language goes on. We can create a whole dictionary of things that belong to the invisible world. It belongs to the language of the heart. The language in which people since ancient times had communicated, had arranged society so they don't go at each other's throats. You know, so the idea that mine is mine and yours is also mine if I can take it away from you by legal means as they do today. The idea that there is no absolute concepts of innocence versus guilty, but there is only winners and losers. The concepts of innocence versus guilt are rooted in ancient text revered by civilizations. As civilizations begin to give up those ancient concepts and replace them with man-made, that society will collapse. So religion has to come together and agree on what is universal, shared values. That what is true, considered true in the high plateau of Bolivia is considered true in Harvard. What is considered true in, in the Borneo of people who are still living in Stone Age or in the Amazonia is true in Oxford. It's true by the learned and the unlearned. It's true by the Hindus and the Baha'is and the Jews who follow the Torah and the Jews who are secular. We need a standard of, of, of truths, of verities that everybody can adhere and can help to create a family, worldwide family, a global family, a set of truths that will parallel the sets of, 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 of scientific discoveries that are creating the modern world, the global, the global world, the globalization. Religions individually cannot do. They need to come together. Dr. Antonio Betancourt, thank you so much for being our guest today on The Dividing Moment. You shared some brilliant analysis with us and some really deep wisdom. And I want to thank you so much for uh, being here today and sharing that with us. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You've been watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. You can find us on the internet at www.definingmoment.tv. Thanks for watching and have a great day.